Good morning, everyone. Are you ready for the next session? Yeah. Yay! Hi, I'm Lisa Yezik. I'm a professor of science fiction studies from Georgia Tech, and I'll be your host for this session. Um, I want to thank Jason Ellis for bringing us all here today, and I'm particularly excited about this because, as some of you already know, Jason was one of my students as an undergraduate and was, in fact, one of the first members of my science fiction lab. So the, the student exceeds the master, right? Here he is today. So this is wonderful. All right, so this is our panel on marginalized voices and feminist futures. And we'll have three people reading. For those of you who are not familiar with how scholarly panels roll, we're going to do this in the traditional scholarly format. And what that means is I'll introduce each author, they'll read their paper, and we'll hold questions until the very end, if that's OK. And we should have um, at least 15 minutes. And, and Jason says we can go into lunchtime if we want to. So we can talk as long as we would like. Um, so that's about it. And then just other than that, um, that's it. Let's just get going. I want to let them talk. All right. So our first person who's going to be reading is Marlene S. Barr. And Marlene is known for her pioneering work in feminist science fiction and teaches English at the City University of New York. She has won the Science Fiction Research Association Pilgrim Award for Lifetime Achievement in Science Fiction Criticism. Barr is the author of Alien to Femininity, Speculative Fiction and Feminist Theory, Lost in Space, Probing Feminist Science Fiction and Beyond, Feminist Fabulation, Space Postmodern Fiction, Genre Fiction, and Genre Fiction, A New Discourse Practice for Cultural Studies. Barr has edited many anthologies and co-edited the science fiction issue of the PMLA. She is the author of the novels Boy Pioneer and Boy Feminist Planets, a fake memoir. Her latest pu publication is, long title here, let's see if I can get it right, When Trump Changed, the Feminist Science Fiction Justice League Quashes the Orange Outrage Pussy Grabber. <laughs> And I believe there are flyers for that up here. So just in case you missed any of that wonderfulness, be sure to get one on your way out. Thanks. And with that, let's have Marlene go. Okay, I'm a feminist science fiction scholar. And I recently started writing fiction. And I'm writing Trump fiction, because I don't know what else to do about him. And I wear two hats. But I'm going to go back to my traditional hat of presenting a scholarly paper. And I'm going to talk about a story in the current issue of Animal Analog. It's by Rachel Rodman. And it's, it's called The Evolutionary Alice. It's on page 112. If you have a copy, you could maybe follow along with me. And I'm not sure that you know that much about Rachel Rodman, so I'm going to introduce her a little bit first. Rachel Rodman is a London-based geneticist who models texts after biology and cultural processes. She writes about hybrids, chimeras, and other species, and organ transplants. And I'm going to discuss how her, the evolutionary Alice breaks apart social categories and biases which emanate from them. And since you may not be familiar with her, I thought I'd let some of her own text waft over you before I get into my text. So I'm going to read you a few examples of her science writing so you can see what she is interested in. And I think that will help you understand my paper better in case she's not familiar to you. So this is part of Rodman's science writing. She says, in other words, equally failed, organisms were instead grouped by superficial characters. Birds were welded to flying insects. Whales were welded to jellyfish. So she's putting disparate animals together. And she says, organisms are grouped by precisely the same chemistry as non-organisms. Molecules of intense reordered may contribute to the whale. Molecules of jelly beans reordered may contribute to the tiger. So she's mixing up whales, jelly beans, and tigers, which is a disparate conglomeration. And she says, these new dynamic converting the writing desk to the laboratory and the classic text to the microorganism may, in addition, pose its own ethical questions. We exist in a world we are exciting and distorting in which neither text nor genome is immutable, and in which humans, armed with new technology, are, forced, are forcing their evolution. So she's using the fantastic to put disparate organisms and texts together. 
And finally, she says, in the lab, it sometimes notes, makes sense to combine the eggs and sperm of distinct, distinctly related species. What would the creation look like if they had been born? By crossing yaks and cows, we can make yak cows. By crossing cows and buffaloes, we can make buffalo, uh, buffalo cows. We may never get to taste motion mutton beef. That's a shame. Imagine maybe a new sea animal living in the, in the Atlantic. Perhaps it would have a pig's head and snout attached to a long, wiggly body. Though, fright, right, though frightful in appearance, it could taste like bacon when caught and fried. I guess it wouldn't be kosher, it must be fat, you know, wouldn't want to eat it. So now that you are familiar a little bit with Ms. Rodman, and to begin my paper, I use two texts as, as epigraphs to my paper. One is David from writing in the Atlantic, and the second one is Annalise Newlitz writing very recently in the New York Times. So Frum says, like Lewis Carroll's Cheshire Cat, when Donald Trump, Trump fate, I call him Trump, I guess it's a Freudian said. When, like Lewis Carroll's Cheshire Cat, when Donald Trump fades from the, sh from the scene, his teeth will linger after him, but unlike the cat's teeth, they will not be smiling. They will bite and draw blood for years to come. And Annalie Newlis says, Sophia Omaja Noble was one of the first researchers to warn the public about bias in algorithms. She identified how data from social media platforms get fed into algorithms, amplifying human biases about everything from race to politics. So my paper begins by combining Nulitz and Frum. David Frum uses Alice in Wonderland to discuss Trump's damaging legacy and Adeline Newlet's com comments upon human biases. Rachel Rothman's <coughs> evolutionary Alice in the manner of a fractured fairy tale juxtaposes Frum and Newlet to break apart Alice and insert a contemporary feminist reading about abolishing categorization within the textual spaces she opens. Treating the Alice text as a genetically modified organism, she transforms it into a treatise against the harm derived from the knee-jerk social biases emanating from categorization, resulting from, for example, racism, sexism, and political difference. By morphing text and biological, co biological context, she challenges automatic bias categorized by using fantastic combinations to create new and impossible species. Her Cheshire cat would smile when it closely encounters the something new under the sun at once combined liberally brilliant and conservatively daft human political animal called the Warren Trump, satirically resplendent in a too long red tie and comfortable brightly monochromatic jacket. The evolutionary Alice opens with the caterpillar trying to categorize, categorize Alice by asking, quote, who are you, unquote. He, quote, maintained that as an anthropoid and more particularly a prostatome, he was fundamentally superior, unquote. When Alice replies, quote, that she was a deuterosterone, the caterpillar again asks who she is, this time with a little sneer, unquote. The caterpillar articulates the story's focus on scientifically false superiority emanating from manufactured difference. After all, Alice and the caterpillar, quote, had their shared an ancestor 800 million years ago, unquote. Despite the lengthy time span, their ancestor is shared in fact. Alice herself is not free of categorization bias. She is made comfortable by the fact that the white rabbit like her were, quote, both deuterosterones and mammals, too, unquote. She treats the mock turtle with derision derived from difference, quote, that was reptiles for you, she says, unquote. Categorization emphasized, emphasis continues when the March Hare asks Alice if it is, quote, a bilateral, unquote. 
The March Hare, reassured that Alice is part of his, of his category, invites her to join a celebration for the, quote, 800 millionth birthday of the Urbilacterian, the last common ancestor of all bilacterians, unquote. This temporal affinity of all is, is as fatuous as claiming social superiority for, which, for being a daughter of the American Revolution, quote. Alice perceived that this was a very small party, unquote. American skinheads are a very small party too, quote. Alice, this was all specifically unsettling, unquote. Ditto for Americans who don't think that Nazis are good people too. Categorization in the story is a thing which falls apart when Alice cannot pigeonhole the playing cards who play croquet. She wonders, quote, where, if anywhere, did these creatures even belong? And the prospect of, uh, frankly, that they might not even belong to the tree of life was by far the most distressing idea Alice had encountered all day, unquote. The Queen of Hearts pontificates about how the origins of the species is a fixed definition involving separatism. She says, quote, every species the queen was explaining with a shearing gravity had been created separately and by a supreme intelligence all in one day, unquote. In the manner of New York liberals contemplating religious fundamentalists, Alice wonders if the queen's audience of wrapped of quote unquote rat playing cards or quote simply dreadfully stupid, which is a false categorization in itself. The Queen responds to Alice's dissenting opinion by quote becoming a apocalyptic apocalyptically purple, unquote. As the Queen quote bellows off with her head, unquote, it is clear that the Queen's color purple is no compromise, such as the one derived from combining American red states and blue states. Like a victim of sexual and racial abuse, Alice runs. Her path is blocked by, quote, very oddly colored, unquote, rose bushes, quote, red painted, splashed over white petals, unquote. Hence, the red roses are false category analogous to the fantastic whitewashing characterization narratives upon which racism is based. Alice, hiding in the rose bushes, torn by thorns and paint smears, sees a category-busting vision. Quote, the ancestor, 1.5 billion years dead, that linked her with the roses, unquote. The ancestor, the hero of the story, is a fantastic gen genetically modified organism. It is a, quote, plant animal matriarch unquote, which symbolizes the biological truth. All living things are part of an integrated ecosphere. They are not segregated by categories. After Alice calls flowers, quote, distant cousins, unquote, she wakes up and encounters her sister reading on the origin of the species. Alice, glad that her head is still attached to her neck, laughs and feels quote, warm and reassured and right, unquote. Darwin and the science he represents wins the day against non-factual, divisive, fake biological news categorization stories. Alice and her sister see, quote, their last common an ancestor, a woman who they both simply called mother, unquote. Rodney defines mother in a way which vastly differs from Mike Pence's use of the word. Mike Pence falsely categorizes his wife, Karen, Karen Pence, as his mother. Rodman, in contrast, imbues the word mother with feminist, scientifically factual power. All living things, including plants which grow from seeds, belong to one biological category. All living things have mothers. Sisterhood and motherhood are powerful. They can supersede sexist and racist fantasy categorization stories, which are science fiction, not science fact. So thank you very much for my reading of Rachel Rodman's 
story, and I think it's still like a Trump story, but I guess it juxtaposes myself as a scholar and a emerging science fiction writer. So thank you very much. All right, next up we have Adam McLean, who is a Master of Theological Studies candidate at Harvard Divinity School. Adam studies the intersection of gender, sexuality, theology, and literature with an emphasis on questions of identity and temporality. At Brigham Young University, his undergraduate, he served for three years as the managing editor of the award-winning science fiction and fantasy magazine, Reading Edge. And he has presented papers at Life, the University, and Everything, the International Conference for the Fantastic and the Arts, the International Congress on Medieval Studies, North American Science Fiction Association, the North American Science Fiction Association Conference, the Society for Utopian Studies, and the Science Fiction Research Association. Obviously, Adam is a man who gets around, and we're lucky to have him here today. that the title is a little bit changed. It's not in all 90 years, because 90 years of a magazine, as amazing as astounding and analog, is about 1,200 issues, and that's a lot of issues to look through. <laughs> I've been through about two to 300 so far, so that's about three months of work there. So <laughs> I did not get to all 90 years, so I'm gonna focus more with this presentation on the scope of the project that I'm working on right now, and what I hope to see will come from it, and what I hope to see we'll be able to talk about with it. Um, man, I'm very clumsy, as you can see, so we'll deal with that as it comes along. Um, also, if I move away from this and you can't hear, please just like, raise your hand or let me know. Um, I do have a very not loud voice, so <laughs> I like using um, microphones. All right, um, hang on one second. I have all my screens because I'm a millennial. <laughs> So, in the August 1931 issue of Astounding Stories, Bernice M. Harrison of Indiana wrote in an ex in, um, in to express that she was, quote, a female woman, who read the magazine, even though, in a previous Reader's Corner, Jim Nicholson had considered, quoted from Harrison, quote, the females who consider him crack for reading science fiction and only women who do not care for science in the stories. Harrison um, stated un unequivocally that she was a female woman and that the men who were in her community laughed at her for reading such a magazine. This, um, this write-in right here shows that, that readers, even at the beginning of Astounding and Analog, were aware of the various tropes and stereotypes within science fiction, that it's mostly men you know, reading about science and male bodies and minds reading about um, reading and creating science fiction. Um, and she was very aware of that, and she wanted people to know that, you no, know, there are women reading. And so, in all the way in 1931, I think this is the like, seventh issue then, seventh or eighth issue, there are readers who are aware of this stereotype and aware of this um, gender bias that is occurring. The question of gender continues into later reader commentaries of the 30s. In September 1931, Virginia E. McKay wrote in to say, quote, a great many men and boys seem to think that girls do not care for science magazines, but they are wrong. Almost all of my high school girlfriends read astounding stories or other science fiction magazines. In fact, more girls read them here than boys. While this isn't a broad sociographic statistical study, um, it does show that gender is an ongoing question in the early years of astounding and analog. Even in the January 1932nd issue, for example, um, Helen Hubert wrote in to share with the editor whom girls prefer, which I don't know if the editors get commentary like this in nowadays, but back in the 30s, they really wanted them to know who the ladies were preferring when it came to the people writing. Um, and here she mentions stories by Amy Merritt, R.F. Starzl, Murray Leinster, and Charles Willard Dutton. Um, among others, yeah. Um, so I pull out these different reader comments to show that gender has been a question from the beginning of the standing analog. 
the readers have been aware of different factors within that. Um, when I saw this conference, I decided to create a project um, that I wanted to have finished by now. I now realize it's going to take maybe a year or longer to um, fully realize everything for it, but it's a project that I'm calling the Visualized Gendered Voice in Science Fiction Project. It's a long-term endeavor that hopes to show how various genders have been given space in science fiction literature to share their forms of the future with the world at large. The larger project will be looking at various science fiction publications and determine over time how many pages specifically were given to various gendered beings. I, I say very certain words in there um, to make it broad enough to include more than just the simple binary of male female, but also to reflect on how we can go across different magazines, so how we can go from Astounding Analog to Asimov's to other magazines to compare how these have been given to public <coughs> ratios and various graphs across time to see how we as a community are providing for all voices to share in the future together. Um, when I've discussed this project with various people, they've gone, oh, you know, early science fiction is just gonna be all male. As you'll see later in the presentation, that's not true, um, even for astounding and analog. Um, but for today, um, as I said, I had hoped to provide a broad look at all 90 years. That's not uh, um, available yet. But um, I've decided to focus later on, after discussing the methodology and some of the shortcomings of this project that I hope we can discuss later on throughout the day, um, if you come up to talk to me or afterward in the Q&A, um, on how to improve the project, since it is more in its infancy. Um, and so the later findings will be specifically on 1930s. So in the methodology, um, yeah, so since I am not a master of coding or software building or any of that variety, and since the various modes of delivery for science fiction content can vary in design, this project requires a lot of groundwork to collect the data. Um, as it is shown on this screen, I basically input every single magazine's table of contents and every single um, thing that is published in a magazine into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I'm on like the 4,000 cell so far um, of my Excel spreadsheet, and I'm only about 10% into all of the issues of the standing analog. And I divide them into various um, things. So you have the year, the volume number, the number, the, um, the title of the things like Holocaust was a story by Charles W. Diffin in the, Jan in the June 31st issue. I put the author, um, the type of story, and then the pages where it starts and where it ends. I have to go through each issue and look at each of them because sometimes the editor decides and explains for the editors to kind of uh, <laughs> throw some shade, but they decide to put an ad in the middle of the story, which is not the person's voice, and so I remove that and I put in the later column, you know, a minus one in order to um, appraise appropriately the amount of pages given to the various people. Um, in addition, there's sometimes pages where there are author buyers at the end, and that's where I can mine to find someone's gender presentation at that time, um, along with um, various stories that are split across pages. So sometimes they'll go for 20 pages and they'll go for the last 20 pages of the magazine. And so I have to find all these as I go through. Um, where, and it's exhausting work, but it's also important work because I'm able to gain an intimacy with the magazine in order to think of how this data can apply and reflect the history of science fiction in general. Um, whereas a coded search for names and pages, I've realized, would provide the same data, the methodology of that would, um, the methodology that I'm applying where I look at every magazine gives me that um, intimate understanding of the media being dealt with and allows for better application of the data to the thing. Rather than here's the data, I'm able to give the data and apply it into a conversation and application to the text itself, to the text surrounding it, and to all of that. So there's multiple layers. Um, additionally, with stories, you see here the big reader's corner. Um, so here you have like a ton of stories, you have the brass tacks, things like that. So I'm able to also see other conversations that are happening within the magazine and growing over the amount of so far, the 90 years and hopefully 90 more years of the sounding and analog. Um, there are certain shortcomings though to a project like this um, that I like to address openly and am, as with the methodology, very interested for input and ideas on how to improve the data and analysis of this data. Uh, or these data. I hate the plurality of data. <laughs> um, yeah, so the first is um, the big elephant in the when, um, the room, which is a determination of gender. How does someone determine a gender of someone who is on a page? Because they're, they're not there, their body is not there, their um, individuality is there in the words, but you can't quite pull from words what someone's gender is. 
Um, gender, as various theorists, scholars, writers, and lived experiences attest to, is complicated. And I do not believe that, that simply words like male, female, cisgender, transgender, non-binary, he, her, te, or z, etc., fully encapsulate an individual's gender identity. There's a complication to gender that I am dealing with as I think through this project. Um, the pronouns, for example, <coughs> help identify someone to the world and identify themselves as they connect to a community. Um, but the words are still symbolic The words are still symbolic representations of a complicated, unique lived experience for each person. Um, I acknowledge that in determining someone's gender off of either a pronoun usage or self-identification or determination of the person's writings and such, at a certain point in time, for example, in the 1930s or even the 1990s and the 2000s and onward, does a harm to the complicatedness of gender. However, it is important, I feel, for us to analyze in mass amounts of data the amount of representation in a given corpus, for then we can assess how various identities and experiences and futures are being represented, and we can make efforts to seek parity and equality of representation if that is our collective goal, which it doesn't have to be. Um, and so that's why I feel it's important to um, make delineations of people, and um, I'm trying to be very aware of that when I assign someone a gender. It's very difficult being a gender theorist to do that, um, but at the same time I feel it's important because it creates this data that we can then work from. Um, the larger and longer project that this presentation is a part of will focus on in-depth research to determine the gender that an author presents. I'm going to get a big long list of all the names and then just start researching them very in-depth, which will be an exciting thing to do. Um, it will look at how each author identifies themselves and the pronouns they use. It will then seek after various interviews and writings of the people, and if a gender cannot be ultimately determined from the broad spectrum that we have of gender, then a gender will not be completely defined. Um, and for a project that hopes to be aware of the complexities of gender and go beyond the binary, I believe that's fine. And so sometimes it may be an unknown gender, perhaps, that they're put into if I can't completely determine. For example, someone um, from, Later on, only had like four, like I was researching them, they only had four stories and astounding. There was nothing online about them, and they had two initials as their name. And I'm like, how do I determine this? So I had to simply put unknown or a third category, um, which I try to attest for that in order to be aware of the um, vast complexities of gender. A uh, second shortcoming is just basic data error and the coherency across various media. Um, because I'm not applying an algorithm to gather the data, there's an opportunity for error, human error, so my error of incorrectly writing down a number or something like that, and I try to amend that by doing a double pass on each of the texts in order to make sure that I'm collecting the correct numbers, and then I um, build that with other um, things throughout the each issue, and I, when I'm doing the math for it all, I double check all the numbers just to make sure. It's a pretty really complicated thing that I'm sure exhausts me, and hopefully you too as I explain it. Um, <laughs> So additionally, um, there's some issues between the various magazines because they come in different sizes. As I saw, I was in the um, archive here yesterday, which is really wonderful. I noticed for the first time, because I was working from these PDFs that I found of the early 30s issues, that um, the 1930s astounding is like that big, whereas the analog today is like that big, right? And so how do I, how do I attest for that um, in this? I, I wish I could do a word count of each story. Because that would be a true comparison. <laughs> but I think that's almost impossible. <laughs> um, I have, a, on a side note, I have another project where I'm looking at Shakespeare's words and relating gender in them, and I'm able to do word count there. But here, I think pages is enough of an equalizer between them to provide that um, ratio building that I want to do um, for it. So let's get to some of the, the basic findings. They are not going to be comprehensive, they are very preliminary. And I focus them on women's voices since I wasn't able to do the comprehensive research that I want to for um, various varieties. Um, and so this is for the 1930s. So for today's analysis, um, so it's focusing, so another thing for a preliminary thing, it was focusing around what I call gender presenting names. And these are names that present for a certain gender according to the time period. Um, and that's how I determined whether someone was male or female within these um, 10 years. So a gender presenting name is a name that colloquially and generally has been assigned to a member of a certain gender. So for example, Juliet would be a female gender presenting name, whereas Romeo would be a male gender presenting name. But I also realize that those names can um, reflect to other genders or other identities. Um, 
So if I came across any that was more fluid between the binaries, for example, Robin, I assigned a third category and I removed it a little bit from the data analysis that you'll see in the next slide. Um, so this first visualization shows um, the difference between male and female voices within it by decades. So the one, two, three, four, all the way to 10 are the 10 decades between 1930 and 1939. You notice here that it's mostly male. That's kind of the basic knowledge that you should have when it comes to science fiction in the early years is it's a very male-focused um, genre. But you also see there that in different decades there are female voices that are breaking and that's the orange part of the graph that is coming into the blue part of the data. And you see, for example, in, In 1937, that there are a lot of female voices. Along with in 1930, the first year, there were some female voices that were able to be shared during um, that. I apologize for the numbers on the bottom. I didn't know how to change in Excel the bottom of the graph. <laughs> so I'm learning some software too as we go through this. Um, so this just gathers a visual representation, which is really what I'm hoping is to be able to show um, people to be aware of you know, the various things. So then you break it down to even further, this is it by every issue from 1930 to 1939, which is a uh, hundred and something issues. Um, it's not a lot of women speaking, which is um, reflective of the time, but also a very sad realization. I kind of have to pull up my other slide because it's animated, which I did not learn today <laughs> how to animate a PowerPoint. But this final thing is some of the things that I pulled across from analyzing these 10 years for amount of women publishing in the first 10 years of Astounding. For example, we had five women who published in that entire decade. We have Sophie Winslow Ellis, she published, I believe, one story. Lilith Lorraine as well. G. St. John Lowe, which um, I'm pretty sure is a woman in just the basic Google research that I did. Um, <coughs> I believe. Um, C.L. Moore was a famous author of the time, and A.R. Long, who published, which is this really unique looking through, she started as A.R. Long using the initials, and then she published as Amelia Reynolds Long. Huh? She started as Amelia Reynolds. Oh, she did, okay. I was looking really fast at the day. Oh, but maybe not in, as, maybe in other magazines, sorry. Oh, oh, so yeah, so in order for this, um, and I think it was A.R. Long and Amelia Reynolds Long and Amelia R. Long throughout those 10 years. So you see this changing of how a woman represents herself to the society. And that, these are points that I would love to delve more into um, as the project continues. In addition, you see, in addition, you see out of 109 issues in 10 years, only 11 issues contain the voices of women. Um, there were 13 different publications, meaning 13 different prose stories. So um, one thing I forgot to add is that this part of the analysis removes um, brass tack, or not, um, readers, um, it, it does basically the plot stories, the poetry, and the science fiction articles, but removes the reader's commentary within the magazine, which is a very core part of analog and astounding um, as they come through these pages. Um, and then, as well, in a total of 14,693 pages, women were only represented in 177 pages of that much prose, which is not that much of representation. Um, so you see there's a, a broad discrepancy, which we would expect of the 1930s, but also uh, not as broad as people who I discussed briefly this project with over the last few months, where they're like, no, no women were publishing back then. There, there were women, and so what this data can also provide is opportunities for us to look more into the lives of these women, into more of the writings of these women, which I think is something that um, we all here on this panel can are interested in. Um, so just some ideas of continuous and conclusions, a little note of hope, because I always believe there's hope in science fiction. Um, maybe with the data that I'm collecting, we can do different decade comparisons. I wish I could do more decade comparisons here. I focused on the 30s because I was running out of time, but I like hopped around on a ton of different issues. Like I have some data from the 2010s, I have some data from the 80s, I have some data from the 70s. Um, and we can pull in different comparisons between not only the decades within a magazine, but also the decades to the time period around them. So you know, between the 30s and today, we have second wave feminism, we have third wave feminism, we have post third, fourth, whatever wave feminism we're in, we have um, the reactions to those things. We have different um, leaders in government that reflect into science fiction. Because as we know, science fiction is always a reflection of its time, along with a reflection of how that time used the future. Um, 
One thing that I found fun in the 1980s issue was this wonderful dialogue between two of the readers. This is um, Jeffrey Caston of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He writes, I'm just gonna read the first little paragraph of it. He says, Dear Mr. Easton, he's writing in response to a specific person who had written a review in the previous issue. He says, quote, I was quite disturbed by your book review in the March Analog. And talking about the ruins of ISIS, you state that it is, quote, feminist, but at the same time, unusually rational and realistic, end quote. You seem to be implying that feminism is somehow irrational and unrealistic. I don't know if you are simply disturbed by something you read recently. Joanna Russ, and especially Susie McKee Charnas, or Carnas are two possibilities. Um, <laughs> or if you are genuinely against feminism. You see, so there's this conversation happening about feminism in the 80s between two authors, and you actually, they lovingly give a response, as I feel, um, going through a lot of the brass taxes where I found the real, like, juicy stuff, but um, I feel like the editor always gives a chance for the person who's a, um, being um, attacked or being thought of um, a chance to respond. So in answer to Caston, Tom Easton says, quote, I am not against feminism, since I am for fairness. I am against rabid or fanatical expressions of anything, from feminism to politics to religion, and all too many feminists express themselves as might of a rabid dog. <laughs> you should publish that in the poetry department. <laughs> it's very metaphorical, right? I'm kidding, no, you don't have to. Um, so you get like these conversations between them, and hopefully what I'm doing in creating this um, archive here, which I can show briefly, it's just this entire Excel spreadsheet that allows you to go back through and look through various authors, for example, in order to sort them and see where they published, how they published, the breadth of their publishing within it, um, and their voice. Um, so here I was able to track down various conversations that happened across years of analog, because the people who are reading analog are very smart people. Um, and they can remember things from, you know, 10 years before they pull it up in a brass tax and they're like, well, let's get this little angry thing here, we're almost time kept two minutes. Um, so finally, as well, I think this can bring about more writing on the marginalized voices throughout the history of analog and astounding. Um, as shown in the 1930s, we have marginalized voices um, talking in the early years of astounding and analog, but also during the 1930s, you have H.P. Lovecraft, Isaac Asimov, and L. Ron Hubbard entering into astounding and analog magazines. So you have these big people who people generally know, but you also have these other people um, like C.L. Moore and others that I mentioned, who are not as talked about and should be as talked about, since we're hoping to provide a more, or I hope we can provide a more broad um, understanding of the history of science fiction. Um, and so I want to end with this quote that I love from Mary Robin Nicole, where um, it's, it's pinned on her Twitter account, and so it's, it's great. It says, quote, it's not about adding diversity for the sake of diversity, it's about subtracting homogeneity for the sake of realism. And I love um, the idea that we're not just you know, seeking a science fiction that is diverse to be just diverse. We're seeking it to reflect the futures of all people so that we can have multiple futures and multiple opportunities to look forward in the future, which is why I, for this project, am focusing on gender so we can broaden that and have that greater um, sense of realism in our science fiction publishing. So thank you. We have Marie Viver, Viver, Viver. Viver. All right, good. Um, who's had six stories in analog science fiction, as well as selling stories to other top markets such as fantasy and science fiction and Lightspeed. She is the lead programmer for digital libraries at Kelvin Smith Library at Case Western Reserve University. Her monograph on the headdresses of 15th century in Northern Europe has been cited in Wikipedia. Ask her more. programmer working at the Kelvin Smith Library, um, we had a we had a alumna donate this enormous collection of science fiction magazines, including almost all of the sounding. And 
my uh, supervisor, the head of digital media, was like, Marie, you're a science fiction writer. Do something with our collection so we can brag about it. So that's where this um, started. And I was like, ooh, can I touch it? Can I touch it? And I got to go down into the special collections room, you know, where they don't normally let plebeians like me. And I'm like, ooh, and I grabbed one right off the shelf, even though you're not supposed to do that. And, I was like, and there was Sophie Wenzel Ellis on the cover of the second issue of Analog Magazine. And I was like, whoa, huh. I knew that women had always been writing science fiction, and there's been a lot of um, publications recently trying to rediscover these voices. Um, another professor at Case just recently put together a complete collection of stories by Carol Winger Harris, for example. But I felt like I wanted to know about the women who maybe just published once or twice, like the, the work-a-day writers like me, you know, nobody knows. So that's so I decided to take a statistical approach, and I'm going to be looking for female names, not females, um, because gender is weird, man. The best I can do is just say this name is female. Um, in credits for fiction, I only looked at short stories. I did not look at poetry or um, fat articles or anything. From 1930 to 2010, I did not want to touch any time that I would be publishing, because um, I want y'all to like me. <laughs> okay, so here are the questions I wanted to ask. How many female fiction authors would a casual reader see in analog? Does it increase steadily over time, or are there periods of regression? Are women's names more or less common on covers compared to the table of contents? I have a personal stake in that one. Um, are there other factors that have an impact, such as the editors or the total number of stories? And how does analog stack up against competitor magazines in the same time period? So yeah, my first problem is what the crap is a female name? Um, we have <laughs> names that belong to people who may use the her pronoun, but are male, like Paul Ash. We have female seeming names that belong to people named him, like Evelyn Waugh. That was very disappointing. <laughs> um, and then initials, C.L. Moore, A.E. Van Vogt. One of these is a man, one of these is a woman, you tell me which. And also, very unusual names are not uncommon in science fiction. We have people whose names are just honestly unusual, like Algis Budris. We have J.G. Carr, who's writing under a pseudonym that's based on her initials, which is kind of a weird name. And then we have, like, Brax. Brax. I'm not gendering Brax. Um, and then there are names that change gender over time, like Robin and Leslie. So my solution was to compare popularity data for the date of publication against the name, and I used every single name. I looked up Jack, I looked up Jill, I looked up every single name, and after every single Robin I looked up came up feminine, and every single Robin actually was a dude, I set my threshold at 30%. If the name was 30% in contention for that year, I marked it neutral. There are 20 names that are exceptions, and if you look up my um, spreadsheet on Open Science Framework, you'll get my exception list. These were names that just, I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't. And Avram was the first. I couldn't make Avram neutral. Avram is a guy's name. I cannot imagine a woman named Avram. Most of these were names that were non-English names because using US data um, for the names, you know, names like Isabel, Isabel, it couldn't find Isabel. It's a girl name. I, I limited myself as much as possible. I only had 20 exceptions, and it came out even, 20 guys, 20 girls. So here's a little bit about my process. My first step was to read every freaking issue of the magazines and manually input them in a database. Yes, I'm a programmer. I wrote a curl script that was going to scrape the ISFDB. It could not determine what was a short story and what was a poem. Um, there was, there was bad, it was bad. Um, and then I tried, I tried to automate the gendering of names using genderize.io, everyone's a girl. Huh. Everyone's a girl, because genderize.io uses uh, machine learning with modern names, and modernly women have more diverse names and men have fewer names. Back in the day when Evelyn was writing, men had more names. So yeah, no, I had to manually do this. I'm sorry, I'm a bad person. So yeah, I manually wrote down everything in a spreadsheet. Then I gendered the names manually looking up <coughs> on this baby names website. The baby names website I used is now down, and I'm very upset about that. 
Um, and then I had two volunteers, Don Vogel and Aaron M. Hartshorn, randomly select issues that I had done and double check my data and regender the names. And then I just made a lot of spreadsheets, guys, and that's what you're gonna see. Um, here's a picture of what my spreadsheet looks like. Adam, if you wanna steal some, you can. <laughs> um, how did that look? This is the first graph I pulled of um, women and men and initials and unknowns uh, in analog um, from 1930 to 2010. And it's a gross, oh, I can't do anything with this. So the first thing I did was to look at just the fraction of female names. It says fraction because I didn't want, I, I didn't figure out how to multiply the column times 100 to make it percent. <laughs> so this is the number of women's names in that year of issues divided by the total number of stories in that issue. And as you can see, drum roll, it trends up. We knew that. Um, but you'll notice that it's really not a steady climb. There's this like peak in the 70s, you know, and then a trough in the 80s. I remember the 80s. And the 90s are pretty jumpy, uppy, downy. Um, so let's look into some of that. But first, some fun facts. Sophie Wenzel Ellis was, our, was in the second issue of Analog. Go, Sophie. The highest percentage of female names in Analog Magazine per the year was in 1995, and that was 25.9%. We can do better. Um, the Analog table had 410 female name credits, representing 143 unique names. And again, I'm not saying these are actually women. These are names that were determined female. I had 6,042 rows of data for Astounding and Analog. 1931 was the only year that analog, I mean, was astounding then. I'm going to just interchose this. Why did you change the name of the magazine? Um, <laughs> 1931 is the only year with no women credits, so that's not too bad. I wondered if my decision about gender and names skewed things, and so I tried to determine gender um, based on pronoun use or use of uh, strongly gendered words like mother or husband. And this is the chart in the orange line are the um, discovered female gender versus named genders. And while there are, before 1988, there are consistently more discovered female than named female, which you can understand. C.L. Moore's cranking them out. There's, there's others, Paul Ash. Um, there's this nice peak in the 70s. Um, and then in the 90s, it's lower. And I'm just going to, I call this, this where strangely, suddenly there are more women's names than discovered women. That's because it's really hard to find the gender of someone in the 90s. They're too old to have a MySpace page. And they're too young to have an obituary. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I compared my undetermined genders over time versus guest female over time, um, they both trend upwards, so it is possible that my undetermines are more likely to be female. So then I looked at initials, and when I compared the number of initials users who I discovered female pronouns for and the numbers of initials users that I discovered male pronouns for, what I discovered is here, the male line is the orange line on top, the female is uh, blue, and the yellow is unknowns. There's kind of an unknown peak again, you know, right around 1989, thanks MySpace. Um, that you see that linearly, the use of initials by men is going down, and the use of initials by women is steady. So, figures will be slightly lower than actual on female participation due to these pronouns, Female use of initials is steady over time. Now, these are the magazines I chose to compare to. I picked them because they are big names and that they had good long print runs. Asimov's Amazing Stories, FNSF, and Galaxy. And here are their little um, percent female versus total charts. And they look kind of weird. Um, although Amazing Stories looks surprisingly like as analogs. Um, at a glance, um, milestones. The first woman in Amazing Stories, um, through my gendering of names method, was Jackie Morgan in 1926, but I don't know. 
Uh, Claire Winter Harris is for sure female from Cleveland, Ohio, and she was in 1927. Um, their peak was 34% in 1990. FMSF's first woman was Winona McClintock, and their peak was in 1991 at 34%. Galaxy's first woman, Catherine McLean, first issue, peak at 35.7% in 1991, 1995. And Asimov's Sally Sellers, again, first issue, 31% um, in 1989. And I thought it was very interesting that the peaks for all five magazines I looked at were, were between 1989 and 1995 and around one third. I thought it would be cool to put them all together. My academians tell me this is a terrible chart, but I love this chart. Um, so what you can see here is that all five magazines have this kind of, I call it like the 90s surge. It's like the 90s was the decade of the woman. There's like a slow creep up into the 70s, except for FNSF who pretty much kick everyone's butt up until Asimov's comes on screen and Asimov's is like, out the gate, dominating, and uh, like this bit over here. This is where Sheila Williams steals all the women. Uh, okay. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that you could see these, these similar um, patterns. So I took just the average across the five magazines, and the blue line is the average across all five magazines of the percent female. And you see again, there's this like steady growth, a dip in the 80s, and then a huge peak in the 90s that dips down in the early 2000s, and then starts to recover itself mostly due to she. Now I'm just buttering her up. Um, when I saw that analog peak in the 90s had those huge bites out of it, I wondered if it might be because analog as a magazine is more likely to have initials users as their um, publications. That was interesting with Amelia Long. She started as Amelia Long, but her first publication in analog was AL, right? So um, if you look at this chart of the average of um, initials users by year for all five magazines, and then purple is astounding analog, you see it's much higher. It's especially early and then in the 90s. So here I just took that chart and I grade over time periods when analog or astounding have more initials users than average. And as you can see, it's most of the time, um, except right in that beautiful 70s peak. Interesting, eh? So compared to other magazines at the same time, Analog's female presence is at times near average or even above on a few points, but they're punctuated by longer periods below average. However, Analog's figures may be adversely impacted by the use of pseudonyms. So let's talk about editors, because I like getting in trouble. Um, <laughs> astounding in Analog, of course, is notable for having 90 years of experience and only six editors. And I'm not going to talk about Trevor because he likes me. No, because I stopped in 2010. <laughs> um, so what I did was I just threw down the editorships um, on the same graph. And immediately, I fell in love with Ben Boba. And I acknowledge that you know there's going to be editors or printing other editors' decisions when they start. But there's this very clear Bova peak. And then, otherwise, Cannibal and Schmidt, they're, they're mostly um, reflecting the time period, but Boba's peak is unique. And it's even more astounding when I look at my discovered female numbers. So, I don't know, Ben. Way to go. Um, but there's a peak, there's a trough after he leaves. Similar happens with Catherine Rush, where there's a, the, of course, she's in the 90s, so maybe, you know, she's just riding the wave. But there's this peak in her editorship and a trough after she leaves. Um, however, with other editorships at other magazines, I didn't really see any correlation. And it could just be noise. This is like a subset of five magazines I'm looking at. Um, Stella Goldsmith at uh, Amazing Stories has a little peak, but she also has that huge trough. And she's got a year with no women. Seely, sorry. I don't know how to pronounce things. I just read. Um, 
Here's Asimov's, you know, chart. And again, I mean, you know, maybe dominating versus the other magazines, but it doesn't look like there's a difference between the editors. So my conclusion is that while an individual editor may positively impact diversity, other forces affect the total most of the time. So what are these other forces? One thing I looked at was the frequency of unique female names because I thought maybe um, what we're looking at is an impact of tokenism. If a particular popular woman is having her moment, you know, if everyone's doing Joanna Russ stories, maybe they're not publishing others. Um, so these, this is the count of unique female names in analog from 1930 to 2010, um, sorted by number of appearances, Maya, Catherine Bonhoff is the star. But I think it's interesting, Pauline Ashwell is so high up there when she mostly, um, she had her career is as Paul Ash, so she was even more dominant than she looks. But again, it doesn't look like, it looks like a pretty decent um, downslope in those mid-list authors. Um, your, your Mary Trezillo's and your Anne McCaffrey's falling in here. Um, and I'm just really interested about the names that I don't see at the top of this list, that I don't know, like Sarah, Sarah Zettel and Susan Schwartz. I want to know more about those ladies. And here's the count for men. Um, obviously, many more points, but it has this very smooth curve. And again, high up on the list, we see Lewis Paget, who's not a dude. Lewis Paget is C.L. Moore and her husband right together. Um, what I found when I then, I thought, well, let me just divide the number of unique appearances, unique names by appearances of that gender name. And what I found was that every, there's four, like there's um, 289 neutral names represented 65 unique names. So you could expect a new unique neutral name every roughly five stories or four and a half stories. Initials names, 709 initials users, 180 unique names. A new initials user could be expected every roughly four stories. Female names came out to every 2.8 or three stories. And male names, you could get a new credit every five stories, 5.1. Male was the, um, the one that had the most star power is what I'm thinking is this is what this is referring to. Dominance by repeated names. So more female one hit wonders and more male stars mean the star power takes up more of the male share of the market. This means that Connie Willis isn't holding you down. Um, but you can still hate her because she's just too good. Um, so I don't think that token females was a problem. Although I do want the methodology. So then I looked at the total number of stories per year. This is just the count of stories per year, all magazines. And I thought it was very interesting that the peak is in 1991, um, right around that time that the women had to peak. If you see here in gray, this is the count of stories by women, just a straight count. And it goes up when the total count goes up. There are places where you know it goes up before the count goes up, like here in the 50s, and it goes up a little bit here just before my cutoff when the number is going down. But it does seem that when there are more stories, there are more, there is more diversity. And it's entirely possible that in 2000, when we were dot bombing and magazines were scrambling for readership and cutting down and magazines were closing, that the fewer places for fiction meant more competition by the traditional, and, and more of the stars, those male stars that take up so much of the market. So that's my conclusion there. The fewer stories in the early 2000s may be what was negatively impacting the gender diversity. Finally, I'm going to talk about women on covers, not like this, <laughs> like this. The first woman on the Standing Magazine, Catherine McLean in 1950. First woman in the pages, 1930. First woman on a cover, 1950. Okay. Oh, no, advance. Thanks. This chart kind of startled me when I looked at it. If you see, the uh, blue line is, again, our fraction female over time. The yellow line is fraction of names on the cover that are coded female. And I was shocked to see these huge spikes 
at the same time that there are spikes in female content. Now part of this is, of course, there's a much smaller data set for the covers, so the numbers are going to jump higher and lower. But it also seems to be that when there is diversity, that it's being promoted more. And then at times, like in the early 2000s and in the 80s, when maybe diversity was not as desired, the, the numbers of women on the cover goes down lower than the number of women in the magazine. And this seems true for astounding and for amazing stories. I then thought I'd switch it around, and I looked at men on the cover over time. So this, the blue line, is men in the table of contents over time in astounding analog, a much less interesting line graph. And the yellow is men on the cover. And the dips, there's these dips in the 40s, which are mostly during the a time when a vast majority of the writers were initials. So that's the initials users squeezing out the men there. And then there isn't, and then the men are above the line. There are more men on the cover generally than in the table of contents until 1989 and the rise of woman power. I'm telling you, the 90s were pretty great. I should have started writing, publishing them. Anyway. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And this is women on the cover, all five averaged. And as you can see, there are a few. It, it smoothed out the peaks. There's a couple of peaks above the average inside the table of contents. But in general, um, it's like the opposite of the men. It's mostly fewer women on the cover than on the table uh, of contents, with a few exceptions. So in general, men get the cover more, and the cover representation may exaggerate with the market values. Here is an overview of my conclusions in this presentation. Um, what was up with the 80s and 2000s? I don't know. There needs to be more research on this. Is it possible that there's backlash after activist editors leave? Um, and also, how do I account for the fact that we have roughly 5,000 male names and 400 women's names, and how do we account for that statistical variance? There's a lot. I, I, I want to do a paper on the freaking like the art and how it changes over time and stuff. It's, it's been such a great experience. And these are some people who helped me out. Of course, Aaron and Dawn, who did my double checking, and my coworkers who like read my paper with me. And my, my sister and my friend Neela, who helped me with my pivot tables. Um, my complete data set is available on the Open Science Framework. I made a bit of the URL for you guys. Um, and it includes data for Omni, Fantastic, Unknown, and Weird Tales, which I did not aggregate into this presentation. Um, and I'm sure I missed something, but thanks. I noticed, I noticed Hank Stein in there. Yeah. Hank Stein was a man, but he had a six change operation and became a Bean Marie Stein, which is perhaps confusing for some people. No, yes, is that why his name was in there? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't know that actually, and I was just going off the fact that after I had looked up the, I, my methodology, I followed the methodology like an idiot. I, I had to be as dumb as possible. So, Hank Stein, and then I looked up a bio, and I got a sheet, and I'm like, Hank Stein is a woman. After he'd written a lot of the stuff he's known for, mm -hmm. he had a sex change. Hi, um, uh, one point about, um, brief point about methodology. Uh, my field, computer programming, uh, did actually peak uh, female participation about the 1950s when my, my um, uncle was a, a programmer. So my look at that. And I think I've heard about like, Swedish gender diversity um, uh, decreases, increases in times of um, increasing freedom in Sweden, but I don't, don't know anything about that. Uh, question is about, C about people like C.L. Moore, where the folklore I was taught was that she did write initially with initials so that uh, so that readers wouldn't be turned off by thinking that she was female. You mentioned another instance 
um, who progressed from using initials to using a female name. Um, could it be that a lot of the initials were, uh, were that? Um, um, and um, um, if so, would, would that affect, uh, affect your results? Um, and, and actually for, um, um, uh, for you, uh, Dr. McClain, I, I really do wish that you would done what Ms. River did um, and have the, the error bar for the, the three categories of the unknown, in, in particular initials. Um, I, I don't know as much about the, the history, but CM Moore is a, a huge example of that, where you know, she did start not being identifiable deliberately, but didn't work, or she changed her mind. Um, I did come across a number of um, women who started with their initials, and then as their careers took off, or as times changed, changed to um, using their first name, yes. And I also came across, actually, um, the Internet Science Fiction Database is a great place to look for that, where they have a tracking of pseudonyms, and you can see not just um, women hiding behind gender-neutral names, but also occasionally um, you have people publishing under less ethnic names or more Anglo-Saxon names, um, which I found very troubling, and I'd love to do another paper on. Oh, well, Isaac has a most Paul French, as an example there. Yeah. I, 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 know I would like to see that graph. Oh, and one other minor point. You don't need to web scrape the Internet's uh, science fiction database. They will allow you to, to download the entire database. I and, and they're, they're, they're help desk. I was afraid to talk to people because I'm shy. You don't know. Oh, their, their help desk is very helpful. Huh. Other questions? The SMO, um, Paul French thing. Paul, the Jew of Nulls were published as Paul French. That's the only reason for that. However, there are people like Andre Norton, whose name originally was Alice Mary Norton, and she had it legally changed to Andre. She had it legally changed after she became famous, and she's from Cleveland, Ohio, librarian <laughs> at the Cleveland Public Library. And yeah, if you look at Starman's Son, it takes place in a uh, post nuclear war Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> I have a whole other presentation on Andre Norton. <laughs> but again, but again, I wanted to be dumb about it because I had a crush on Andre Norton as a kid because he understood women so well. <laughs> and when I met Kim Stanley Robinson, I was hugely disappointed. So um, that was another motivator for me to focus on the gender of the name and not the person. Other questions? Comments? I think the brilliance has stunned them that everyone is silence. <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful, brilliant presentation. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.